Sci-fi fans who love artificial intelligence have a lot to watch these days. There's the new movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix, the upcoming Transcendence with Johnny Depp, and a new show on Fox called Almost Human. Artificial intelligence is back in a familiar spotlight that dates back decades. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Wouldn't you prefer a good game of chess? <laughs> Later, let's play Global Thermonuclear War. Fine. <laughs> All right. You're reading a magazine. You come across a full-page nude photo of a girl. Is this testing whether I'm a replicant or a lesbian, Mr. Deckard? Just answer the questions, please. What does this action signify? As you entered, when you looked at the other human, what does it mean? It's a sign of trust. It's a human thing. You wouldn't understand. The woman that I've been seeing, Samantha, she's an operating system. You're dating in a West? What is that like? <laughs> I feel really close to her. Like when I talk to her, I feel like she's with me. So is it movie magic or is AI too close to reality? James Barrett is the author of a new book, Our Final Invention, Artificial Intelligence and the End of the Human Era. Gary Marcus is a cognitive scientist at New York University who blogs about AI for The New Yorker. Good morning to both of you. Um, mm -hmm. We can talk, to, Gary, let me start with you. We can talk to our cell phones. I, God knows, have long conversations with my GPS on the road. <laughs> but um, how close are we really to artificial intelligence? Well, it depends on how you define artificial intelligence. We're already there a little bit. Artificial intelligence is already ubiquitous. So Siri, for example, is an, an instance of artificial intelligence, and so is Google. But we're a long way from machines of the caliber that you see in her, where they understand our every nuance, where they understand our language, where they understand us as people, where they understand our needs, our desires, what we want to get done. So a long way is, is what, 40, 50 years? 40, 50 years, I think that's a good estimate. You know, James, it's fascinating to me because this seems to be a really polarizing issue. You have one camp that says this is going to destroy us and the other camp that says this is only going to help us. Where do you stand in all of this? Uh, I, I, my, I wrote a book called Our Final Invention about some of the dangers that can, that can happen on the way, on the development trail to creating hu human-level intelligence. There's, there's short-term dangers and there's long-term dangers. Right now we've got uh, a, a debate going on about creating autonomous drones, drones that commit assassinations without humans in the loop. There'll be a debate coming up about autonomous battlefield robots. It's the same thing, autonomous machines without humans in the loop. Um, are we ready ethically to, to, to introduce those machines into the world? And so that's in the short term. There are bigger problems in the long term when you, when you get machines that are fully intelligent, that have intelligence that's somewhat uh, analogous to human intelligence. I mean, is there, I mean, the risk that seems to be posed on the table is, is can they evolve beyond our ability to control them or, in fact, understand them? Absolutely. They can. Uh, they can. Uh, it's... Right now, we're creating machines that, that are extremely good at chess, that are extremely good at, at Jeopardy, that do things like navigation, uh, fear improving, uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of tasks that used to be ours alone. Someday in the not too distant future, we'll create machines that are good at artificial intelligence research and development. After that, their capabilities will, will ex accelerate dramatically. Gary, there's one piece of this puzzle, though, that, as Anthony mentioned out, we've seen GPS can't do, and that's common sense. How do you teach a robot common sense? Can you? Well, that's one of the hardest problems, and nobody's really there yet. I think part of the problem is everybody's trying to use big data. They're trying to collect all of the data that's out there on the web in order to solve the problems. And there's always something that you need to do that you haven't found that's already on the web. So if I ask you whether alligators can um, go over hurdles in a steeplechase or something like that, you can't find the answer on the web. You have to think about it as a human being. You have to use what you know about physics, about objects, right. um, and so forth, and put all that together. And we don't know how to build machines yet to do that. Are people working on that? People are working on it, but not very much, because mostly they're going where the sort of low-hanging fruit is. The low-hanging fruit is, let's get something else from the big data. Right. And the big data is not doing what I call the long-tail problem. So 
there, there, where you have a lot of data already available, big data is good, but there are some things where you're never going to have much data, where you're going to generalize to something that you haven't seen before. It goes back to Chomsky's point that you can understand a sentence that you've never heard before, or at least you can tell if it's grammatical. If I say colorless, green ideas, sleep furiously, you may not have heard it before, but you know it's grammatical. We have this way of dealing with the unexpected, and we don't yet know how to build machines that do that. So that's really the rate-limiting step. But there are people that are working on it. Uh, Psycorp has been hand-coding uh, a common sense database since 1985. Um, Carnegie Mellon University has a machine called NEL, Never Ending Language Learning, that's reading the internet in order to try, it, and also getting hand coded to try to absorb common sense information. Um, Watson had 200 million pages. Well, IBM's Watson, the Jeopardy, Jeopardy champion, right. had 200 million pages of information, including common sense, uh, the relationships like cups go on tables and you can cup your hands common sense stuff. So people really are working on that. So Gary, you know, I think people think this is so far off. At the State of the Union address next month, we're actually going to hear the president talk about a possible commission to look into AI. I'm curious, though, why are we seeing them now take people that used to go to Silicon Valley and, and bringing them into academia? What, what is the goal there? I, I'm not sure I understood, understood the question. So um, I think it's really important to have a commission, though, to study artificial intelligence um, because of the implications that James is talking about that I've been talking about in my column in The New Yorker. So we have to worry about employment, how, how things are going to be affected, for example, as driverless cars become pervasive and that they're no longer taxi drivers. So there's a huge um, employment problem coming. And then there's the potential of, of machines that might fight us for resources. It's not guaranteed. You see the kind of Terminator scenario and people laugh at it right. because that's science fiction. But we don't actually have a guarantee that it won't happen. And I think it's really important to start thinking now about how to keep us from having that kind of scenario. Nobody has a perfect solution that will guarantee that machines do what we want them to do. I mean, there's always already this problem of machines doing what we tell them to do rather than what we really want them to do. And as they get more powerful, that's going to become a more significant problem that we Gary really have to Marcus, cope with. we've got to run, but we could talk about this the whole show. Gary Marcus, James Barrett, thanks so much for being here this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us.